It is okay then. I got out. I managed to get to right, the station. It's okay. Is everybody out of the building? No, there's still my partner in. Right, is he able to... to get out of the building? No, because the spy is near the door. When the call came in, it seemed an unlikely town and an unlikely venue for this sort of thing to happen at a joinery shop, after tea, when you wouldn't expect people to be working. Things just didn't seem quite right. Everybody was really quite worried. You know, it could have been the person that you walked past in the street. It could have been anybody. I don't know how anybody could live with it, knowing that they burnt somebody alive. Everybody was so shocked and everybody was, was locking up more and feeling a bit worried about it all because nothing like this had ever happened in the village. A few miles from the bustling seaside resort of Skegness sits the small picturesque market town of Borilamage, affectionately known by its residents as the village. Everybody here calls it a village because we feel like village people. We're so connected and, and so we help one another. Borough La Marche is a typical Lincolnshire village on the edge of the Lincolnshire Wolds, famous for its windmill where people are hard working and just get on with their lives. I've had a salon in Borough La Marche for 14, 15 years and it's a lovely, quiet village where everybody knows everybody, they got everybody gets on with everybody in my clients are lovely. But the peaceful tranquility of the village is about to go up in flames. We've just gone up to the workshop to, to pick some things out. Yeah. And somebody came and put us behind. Yeah. And they, 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 they tagged us and set fire to the place. The workshop on fire belongs to well-known local couple, David Twig and Julie Dixon, who own a joinery business next to their home. As the emergency call comes in, Lincolnshire Fire and Rescue Station Commander Gary Milson is immediately dispatched to the scene. Once I received the call, I'd be straight into my car and, uh, and making headway down to Borough Marsh. It's only a few miles down the road. There's not a lot of time to, uh, to mull over things and, and get other information in. The information that was relayed to me at that point was that two men dressed in black and wearing balaclavas had accosted uh, David Twig and, uh, and his partner. Uh, they'd locked David into the storeroom and then proceeded to pour petrol into the foyer of the building uh, and lit it before fleeing the scene. As I approached the premise, there was a white picket fence surrounding it. It seemed quite surreal, the appliances at the bottom with the lights on. As I walked past that towards the entrance where the activity was taking place, uh, the incident commander gave me a, a quick brief and said that uh, there was very little fire and the fire was out and they was now trying to locate Davy Twig, who they'd been informed was locked in a, a room inside the building. With the blaze having been brought under control and extinguished, Gary and his team desperately tried to locate David Twig. The workshops were an old railway buildings. They were long and thin. And at the end, there was a small area with a, with a kitchen, a storeroom and a toilet uh, and a small foyer that linked these all together. And they were all involved in the fire. They was all black uh, and heated and sooty. But they were all empty apart from the storeroom door that was locked. There was no keys present. The decision was made that the wall might be easier to break through than the door and a hole was made in the wall when we could see that there was somebody that, who appeared to be on the knees facing the door. We tried to rouse them uh, through shouting and speaking to them, but there was no response. With David not responding, the urgency to reach him grows and the fire crew break deeper into the wall, releasing the door. As the door opened, um, David Twig fell forward into our arms and forward, forward onto the floor. The crews immediately turned him over and, uh, and began resuscitation. We had an ambulance already in attendance and the paramedics were very quickly there and uh, we, we assisted the paramedics in, uh, in placing him uh, into the ambulance where they could work on him further. In the back of the ambulance, paramedics battled to resuscitate David Twig. The time frame from, from the call to us getting Dave, David out of the cupboard 
may have been around about 10 to 15 minutes and then then we worked worked on him for a, probably another 15 20 minutes after that before the uh, the paramedics uh, decided to uh, to call time and uh, and pronounce him dead with david dead the situation immediately changes and a murder investigation is launched the first information I got was that there'd been a fire um, at a business premises uh, near Skegness in Lincolnshire, of course, um, and that two men had been involved. They'd made off um, where they hadn't been found at the moment. A man had tragically died, um, believed to be the owner of the business, uh, and his partner, who worked with him, a lady, um, had been quite badly injured in the incident. Um, she was being taken to hospital to be treated, uh, and officers were at the scene. So lots of things going through your mind, but at no stage anything other than, you know, this is a murder case, uh, it's tragic, David Twigg has died, and we need to find these two people as soon as possible. With fire crews, police and paramedics at the scene, it isn't long before news of the tragedy spreads around the town. It was a big event for Lincolnshire. Um, a robbery homicide in a small village like Borough La Marsh is something that had never happened before um, in my 25 years covering the area, um, and it may well never happen again. Rumours I heard was they were looking for two men, and my house faces a back field, and of course the drones was going over there. Uh, there, were, there was quite some noise, and, and I didn't, I couldn't believe it actually. The whole village were stunned that something could have happened on the doorsteps. It was big news and everybody was really quite worried that whoever did it could have been out there and they could have been next. You just don't know. There was a lot of anxiety in the community. Um, Borough Marsh is a, a long way from the nearest police station, a long way sometimes from the nearest police officer and local people were obviously very concerned that they may be the victim of a similar burglary. In the Lincolnshire town of Borilla Marsh, police have launched a murder investigation after local joiner David Twigg was pronounced dead following a fire at his workshop. His partner, Julie Dixon, had managed to escape and call 999, reporting that masked intruders had broken in, locked David in the storeroom, and set the place on fire. The impact on the local community after this happened was immense. It's the only way I can describe it. Um, I was clearly getting phone calls. The local community officers were being stopped in the street. People were going to the police station. There was a kind of sense of not just why has this happened, but, but who's responsible? And, and just as importantly, is it going to happen again? Is somebody else going to be you know, the target of these two individuals? And nobody could think of a reason why David and Julie would be targeted. David Twigg was an only son. Um, he grew up in the area. His parents remained in the area. Um, he was a master joiner, very popular and a hard-working man in the local area. Um, he was also a very big man, um, well over six feet tall and 19 stone, but he, he was a presence in the community. David met Julie in 1996 when she was going through a divorce. The pair quickly moved in together. They remained together for 15 years. Um, they came across as a, as a, as a typical middle-aged couple. In Borough La Marche, um, David and Julie were seen as a team. Um, David was the carpenter, the joiner um, at the business, and Julie was the doing the finance and the accounts for the business. Outside of joinery, David soon discovered a new hobby, stock car racing which opened up a whole new social circle for him and Julie, with professional racer John Mickle and his wife Lisa. So from that very first race meeting, really kind of just kicked it off. Uh, we enjoyed each other's company. They wanted to come to every single race meeting. They wanted to be involved. 
and David soon found a way to combine work with his newfound love when he set up a sideline alongside his joinery company. As David's business grew, um, he was quite happy to sponsor the motor racing team. That was one of his pa one of his passions, and so they undertook that deal, which was several thousand pounds. Julie and David were keen to promote this new Kitchen Bits and Bobs business, which is an online business that they were trying to get off the ground. Uh, I think they felt that probably some branding on the race cars, um, and then obviously we can promote it through social media as well. The sponsorship proved very successful. David particularly got on very well with the racing team, and they were invited over to America to watch the team racing and all seemed well. It was a very happy relationship and he got on very well with them. I think from the beam on his face when we first, you know, agreed at Lydon Hill, he just seemed incredibly proud. He seemed very smiley. And you could tell he was passionate about his business and this was something that he felt was going to enhance um, the, the people that would, would see his work. The friendship between the two couples started to grow stronger. I think from the very first time we met them, I really, really liked what they brought to the team and, you know, the energy. Um, and we just, we call it a race family and it just felt like they were going to become part of our race family. Julie wanted to be hands-on with me in the kitchen um, while David was very quick to throw himself into the deep end with John on the mechanic side as well. They just got stuck in. It wasn't just about the racing anymore. Um, they started to get quite involved. Um, she wanted to be involved in, in the family life that we had as well. Um, she would buy presents for my children who were aged four and seven then. Um, you know, they looked fondly upon her and David as well. So they became family friends. And it was Lisa Julie turned to in the aftermath of the tragedy of David's death. The very first time I heard about David was on Monday morning. I had a phone call somewhere between 7 and 7.30 in the morning from Julie. She basically was hysterical. She was shouting down the phone, he's dead, he's dead. And I really didn't have a clue what she was even talking about. I didn't know who's dead. I said, Julie, who's dead? She said, David, David's dead. Um, and. I then tried to get some more information. You know, what's happened? She said, a fire, a fire. So none of her sentences were very long. It was just words being thrown out at me. Um, I said, a fire, what, you, there's a house fire? She said, no, workshop, fire, um, masked men, uh, attacked. But from that phone call, I immediately knew I had to go and visit her straight away. I knew it would be a long journey up to Lincolnshire, probably four hours. I just grabbed my purse, my keys, and left. So the four hours going there was, it's a very weird and surreal situation. You keep thinking, you know, has this really happened? Is this some kind of, you know, is this true? Is it real? I, I, I just can't get my head around it. It's an awful lot of information, hearing her so upset on the phone. And those words, he's dead, they just kept playing and playing in my head. When Lisa arrives at Julie's parents' house, she finds Julie in a state of shock. Uh, Julie was sitting and rocking in a chair. I was absolutely taken back when I first saw her because she had burns on her face. She told me that her and David on the Sunday had gone down to the yard, which is just a, a short stroll from the house, to lock up. That's all they were doing, they were going to lock up. She said that she had asked David to go into the storeroom to get a light bulb. Um, and these two men wearing balaclavas, dressed in black and hoodies, had come into the barn, had locked David in the cupboard and then had grabbed her and that they had tried and forced her towards this circular saw. Um, I asked her how she got away and she said, I just squirmed out of, she said, lucky I was wearing a hoodie. I squirmed out of it and ran. She said she ran out of the door, she ran across the field um, and 
then I think after a short space of time, she turned round to look back to see that these intruders were also leaving the premises, and that they'd shut the door behind them. She was then concerned about David, so she went back to the barn. And when she opened the door, suddenly the combustion, the flames, that's what had caused the burns to her face. While Lisa consoles her heartbroken friend, police turn up to interview Julie as a key witness to the crime. She was only able to, to give um, some basic details. Um, we didn't want to push too hard, of course. She's a victim, she's lost David in the most awful circumstances. Clearly the 999 call provided us with a little bit of information, which was helpful, but we wanted to try and dig deeper if we could. Um, so we had to ask those difficult questions as early as possible. She was interviewed by specially trained officers, but sometimes it just wasn't possible to continue with interviews because um, Julie wasn't in a uh, emotionally fit state to, to carry on at that point. So we had to do lots of short sections rather than a, a really long and, and draining and demanding interview. With little information gleaned from Julie and an ease growing among the locals, police turned to the public for help. In the hours that followed, Lincolnshire Police made appeals for the intruders and did reveal that a 999 call had been made by Julie Dixon uh, and gave the description of these two masked men who had been to the workshop and that Julie had managed to push one of them away and escape and then rang the fire brigade on 999. I remember holding more than one press conference, which wasn't just local and regional, it was national as well, because this was big news in terms of you know, what had happened and, and where it had happened and the type of community that it was affecting. As Lincolnshire Police continued to make these appeals, we would take that information and circulate it amongst the various radio stations, local newspapers, daily newspapers in Lincolnshire. And the police were obviously very anxious to get that, that message out as wide as possible. With Lincolnshire police desperately trying to piece together the events of the night and establish the identity of the masked men, Fire Commander Gary Milson scours the crime scene for clues. Once the fire's been extinguished, we then start on the scene preservation side of it. And as we withdraw from the, from the building, we're trying to make sure that anything that has been removed out of the building is, is logged or is placed back into the building with care so that should we need to, we can rebuild that picture, that jigsaw puzzle to help us find out how the fire started. I've dealt with quite a few fires and unfortunately fatal fires as well and murder cases and it's probably one of the most challenging cases that you have to deal with because by its very nature fire destroys and fire destroys evidence, not just the fire itself but the, the water that's used. Having established petrol was used as the accelerant, senior investigating officer Stuart Gibbon begins trying to make sense of the scene. All uh, police officers and detectives are um, constantly reminded about how important the golden hour is. Um, it's a time where you can lose evidence, um, but if you get it right and you gather the evidence and secure and preserve that evidence, it can have a positive impact on the, on the rest of the investigation. The goal now in this particular investigation was kind of twofold. One was about securing the workshop to make sure that we could get access to it and that nobody else used it. And it could be forensically examined over a period of days, which it was. Um, also, from a financial point of view, it wasn't going to be a, a kind of random attack. It did, that is something that I almost, um, almost eliminated from a very early stage, simply because of where it is. So was it a customer that had been in before? And then you start to think about the, you know, the reasons why. Is it financial? Um, is it a robbery or a burglary that's gone wrong? D did David um, owe somebody some money and they were trying to recover the money? So we, we drafted in a financial investigator working with the police um, and he was starting to look at the actual uh, basics of the business, you know, um, how it was doing financially, what was going on. Could David have been targeted for money? Was it a revenge attack for a business deal gone wrong? Or something closer to home? So, Julie did actually 
sent me a few messages and she called me quite distressed, probably a couple of weeks before David was killed. Um, she did say that her telephone had been cut off, but then was restored again. She said that her electricity had been cut off, but restored again. She felt that someone was messing around with them. Aware that this information could be key to the investigation, Lisa contacts the police. So we had a, what are known as a PULSA team, police search advisor team, specialist search officers that, that did a kind of fingertip search in the parameters around the building. And actually they found something which appeared quite significant. Um, deposited in some bushes on a neighbouring um, piece of land next to the joinery workshop, they found some keys and we were able to establish uh, at a slightly later point that one of those keys fitted the storeroom that David had been locked inside. So this is quite a significant find for us. Obviously those items were forensically examined, they didn't yield any evidence, but the finding of those keys um, supported at that point the account that Julie Dixon had given because they were found in the direction that the two offenders were um, alleged to have gone off in. Further inquiries begin to yield some surprising discoveries. I think the first kind of uh, breakthrough in terms of new information for the investigation wasn't surprisingly to do with the two offenders, it was to do with the financial um, affairs, if you like. We'd been led to believe by the inquiries that we conducted that the business was in a good place financially, um, that David was doing well and, and that the accounts were healthy. In actual fact, when we had a financial investigator start to look more closely at the accounts and the business, uh, the opposite was true. They were in dire financial straits, on the verge, if not already, bankrupt, and there were some serious financial issues. Having been unaware of the financial issues at David's business, further inquiries throw up more concerns. The post that was going to the business was supposed to be going to um, David Tweed Drawing. It was actually had been redirected to this garage. And that was quite a big point for us as well, because that, then that begs the question, well, why is the post being redirected? Who's redirecting it? And, and what lies behind that? In Lincolnshire, the investigation into the murder of David Twig has thrown up some suspicious activity around his business. It soon became clear that both the workshop and the bungalow where they lived had been remortgaged. Finances were becoming a little bit more um, of, a, of a priority line of inquiry and, and we needed also to know why the post was being redirected to another address. We were still keeping an open mind. Um, obviously, we were still trying to establish these two mass defenders, who they were, where they were, why they'd done what they did. But, but also, these other things were starting to kind of build up in terms of the finances, first and foremost, very, very different to how we'd initially thought they were. While the investigation homes in on David's financial affairs and whether his death could be linked to a business deal, two months after his murder, David's body is released, so he can finally be laid to rest. Friend Lisa accompanies David's partner, Julie, to the funeral. That was a huge, big turning point for us. Suddenly, my gut feeling started to take over. Um, the funeral, she acted very strange for someone that was basically saying the last goodbye to a partner. She would crack jokes and quite inappropriate jokes, acting slightly inappropriately towards people. She was laughing very, very loud. Then suddenly she'd be upset. Um, it just seemed really irrational. And I felt uncomfortable. But it isn't just friends who have their concerns. Having uncovered some financial irregularities surrounding David and Julie's business, Lincolnshire police have more questions. Yeah, we were looking for answers to these questions and the only person that really could probably provide them was Julie Dixon. I was conscious that we were asking her a lot of questions and being quite direct with her when actually, on the face of it, she was a victim of the most awful circumstances. Um, but we had to ask those questions. We weren't always given the answers uh, that we were looking for. As well as the finances, police inquiries with David's creditors flag up something else. All the inquiries that we carried out with the businesses and the authorities that were dealing with this financial debt, um, nobody had ever spoken 
personally or otherwise with David Twigg. Every kind of communication, be it on the telephone, email, that sort of thing, was with Julie Dixon. Um, and what we also uncovered, which was really quite concerning, was that um, people were being told by Julie um, that um, David was terminally ill, that he was abroad on holiday, that he was really unable to take any calls for various different reasons. Um, and this concerned us because we couldn't corroborate this in any way. Having also discovered the post addressed to David's business was being redirected to a local garage, Stuart and his team trawl through the garage's CCTV, hoping it will reveal who is behind the redirection. Instead, they find another clue. And when we examined that CCTV, we found um, that Julie had driven there in a vehicle on the morning of the murder uh, and had filled up um, petrol cans with, with petrol at the location. And when we did challenge her um, with finding that information in the CCTV footage, uh, she told us, of, yes, I, I did go to the garage that morning. Um, we were doing some gardening and I needed to get some petrol to fill the lawnmower up. We established also that um, Julie had a BlackBerry type mobile phone um, and as part of a murder investigation you, you're always looking at mobile phone data because it can tell you a lot of things and we couldn't get into it um, so clearly we asked Julie on more than one occasion could you please help us and, and tell us what the pin number is so we can access this device she was unable to do so she, she said that she'd forgotten she couldn't remember it clearly she had been using it very recently and on the day of the murder we had evidence of that if nobody else uses it and nobody else has changed the pin or password then she must know that number or that code what's in that blackberry why won't she tell us the pin number we really desperately needed to get to the bottom of what had happened and, and this was the point where the investigation focus really changed as the months tick by friends of julie also start to have their doubts as to what really occurred that fateful night One race meeting that I remember very, very clearly um, was the last race meeting that she's ever come to. When we arrived there, there was a police car there. She started screaming and hitting things, shouting at the top of her voice, making some very loud noises. And I just said, Julie, talk to me. What's wrong? Why are you upset? She sat, she rocked, she cried, she rocked, she cried. And then she started saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And I just said, what are you sorry for? Tell me what you're sorry for. She rocked, she cried, I'm sorry. And it was like a repeated process. She said nothing else, she did nothing else. While Julie spends a weekend away with friends, back at the investigation, forensic evidence starts to build up. Now, the account Julie gave was that she, the two men had come in, there'd been a tussle, she'd managed to get out of the place, um, and she'd gone to ring 999, and then she'd noticed them running out, the two offenders, and they ran off round the back, and she went back in to try and rescue David or find him, and as she opened the door, there was a flashback, and she was hit with the, the, the fumes from the, from the fire and the, and the explosion and that was how she got the injuries. Actually, forensic evidence would say otherwise um, and would indicate that it was what's known as a vapour cloud. When the petrol would be originally poured into the foyer and lit, um, as the petrol's ignited, the vapour cloud would ignite first and anybody in that vicinity would get caught in that vapour cloud uh, and depending on the, the amount of vapour and the intensity of it, they may just get slight singeing and flash burns or they could indeed get quite badly burned. That seemed to be fitting more with the burns to Julie Dixon than rather what she was telling us that she would open the door and it flared up. In fact, we found it, we considered it quite unlikely that she had opened the door and the petrol had flared up like that. Once it's lit, it's done that initial flare up and it's unlikely that that would happen again. There was a petrol can behind the door. Uh, had she have opened the door right at the start of the fire, she would have moved the petrol can, so that evidence didn't add up. We also recovered from a forensic examination of the bungalow some very small hairs in the, uh, in the bathroom sink. Now again, on the surface, um, first, first viewing, not particularly relevant, but when we have those sent off to be forensically examined, 
and we find out that they belong to Julie Dixon, those hairs. Again, not particularly relevant to her bathroom. She uses a bathroom. There are going to be hairs. Um, they were identified as, um, as uh, eyelash or eye, eyebrow hairs, eyebrow hairs, um, but they were singed. They were burned. That put a kind of different slant on it as well. Finding burned eyebrow hairs revealed Julie had gone into the bathroom after the fire had started, knowing full well her partner was trapped inside a burning building, something which raises suspicion among the police. Not only that, but the fire investigators believe Julie could only have received her injuries if she'd been inside the building when the fire started. Julie Dixon had given various different accounts. She'd given us very little information. Um, the more we tried to put to her um, by way of questions, the more withdrawn she'd become at that point um, and actually became quite defensive at various times as well. Um, and it was at that point that I made this, the decision based on all the anomalies and the significant findings. She was going to be arrested on suspicion of the murder of her partner, David. Three months after David's death, and news of Julie's arrest soon spreads around her hometown. Obviously, there had been a lot of anxiety and fright in the community about intruders being at large. So in some ways, the arrest of Julie put that to bed. But equally, there was also some anger um, that obviously they'd spent three months believing Julie's story. There was a lot of upset people. She had upset a lot of people because she befriended. Well, she was everybody's friend. She was a very likeable person. And, yeah, it was a big shock to everybody. Julie Dixon is brought into the police station for formal questioning, this time as a suspect, not as a witness. I was prepared, I thought, for most things to come from that interview, including a no-comment interview, which is quite common. Um, so we'd, we'd gathered together as a, as a group, the interviewing officers, yes, sir, the interview coordinator, to discuss what could happen. Um, but what actually did happen, I think it's fair to say, threw us all at that point. She provided a prepared statement. And what it said in a nutshell was that this whole um, situation had been a suicide pact. So what she said was that both her and David had wanted to die due to the dire financial circumstances around the business and personal issues, um, and that they were preparing to do just that, um, but that when, when the crunch came to lighting the petrol and setting the fire, she panicked and ran out of the building, leaving David behind. In Lincolnshire, police are questioning David Twigg's partner on suspicion of his murder. My initial thoughts were that if Julie was prepared to, to lie about two masked raiders and, and, and vent a story around what had actually happened, then what else had she lied about? In interview, Julie claims the fire was a joint suicide pact, but that she had panicked and fled. So police need to establish if there is any truth in her account. Let's go back and speak to friends and family. Was, what sort of state of mind was David in? And actually, fairly quickly, it was established that he was in a good state of mind. Um, he had no idea, we think, that the business was in such dire straits. He had no reason to die. There's no way that David, in his right mind, would ever would do a suicide pact because he loved life too much and he was enjoying it too much. You know, the day, the weeks before he got killed, he was down with us, enjoying it, planning the next year, the next trips, where we were going. He would never have had that in his back of his mind. So we knew for ourselves then that she was bonkers and she had done it and she was now trying to get herself out of a, a murder. Suddenly, here we are, it's now a suicide pact. And who has a suicide pact but's locked behind a door that they don't have the key to? So they couldn't even change their mind if they wanted to. Poor David died on his hands and knees in a praying position leaning against a door that was locked from the outside. That's not a suicide pact. With time running out to hold Julie Dixon without charge, senior investigating officer Stuart Gibbon consults with the Crown Prosecution Service. 
So we clearly were very concerned about this prepared statement and just felt that it was probably another way of shifting focus. Um, you know, we've had the mass defenders, they no, no longer exist now, so now we're going to go down the suicide pact, which is, interestingly enough, is a partial defence to murder, and if found to be true, could result in a conviction for manslaughter rather than murder. So that kind of made sense at that point. Um, we had CPS working with us so we could talk to them about the content of that prepared statement. They were already fully au fait with the evidence that we gathered that far. And the CPS lawyer was happy at that point that there was sufficient evidence to provide a realistic prospect for conviction. So the, the decision was made to charge Julie Dixon with murdering her partner, David Twigg. With Dixon charged with murder, police and CPS prepare for trial. And part of that means trying to establish a motive. Why would Julie want David dead? The main strands of evidence, really, I mean, there were quite a few bits of circumstantial as well, the petrol and the redirection of the post, but the main ones were really the finances. You know, we found out that they were in dire straits. What I think is that it was getting to the point where a warrant was issued for non-payment of fines. The bailiffs were going to turn up at the workshop at some point. That is the stage where David would become aware of the scale of this debt. In fact, the debt existed at all, maybe. Um, and she could, Julie Dickens could then hold that back no longer. That was where it was all going to come to a head. As well as discovering the couple were in serious financial trouble, police now had CCTV proving Julie purchased petrol on the day of the murder but it's forensic evidence of a computer found in the couple's workshop, which really helps build the case for the prosecution. We'd heard stories that she'd been Googling stuff on a laptop, claiming that David had been Googling stuff. How do you commit suicide with it being undetected? She was Googling on her laptop how to poison someone with cakes and how to... Um, get away with murder. As the trial approaches, Julie Dixon changes her story yet again. Things kind of changed a little bit again um, when Julie Dixon then started to say that it wasn't a suicide pact. Actually, David, yes, David did want to die and she was just trying to help him along, basically. Um, so she's trying to remove herself even further from any kind of blame whatsoever. You know, it was David's idea. David wanted to do it. Um, I just kind of helped him. The things had changed hugely since the first 999 call to the emergency services, but we felt we had a strong case. On the second day of that hearing, um, the not guilty plea, which had been entered initially by Julie Dixon, changed to a guilty plea. But she still maintained at that point that this had been all about David wanting to die. Um, that's what the defence was putting forward, whereas our defence was cold-blooded, premeditated, pre-planned murder. With Julie's shocking confession, the trial is halted. Once Julie Dixon had admitted her guilt and pleaded guilty to David's murder, the role of the jury was no longer needed, but then falls to the judge to decide on what basis he believes her plea and on what basis the killing was carried out. So this is what he's called a Newton hearing and the judge hears evidence from all the parties in the case and it's in the judge's role to decide how the murder was carried out effectively. The prosecution lays out its case to the judge, and Julie's 999 call is played to the court. They're tied to them, set fire to the place. So the, the place that she set fire? Yes. Is it the building that's on fire? It is, yes. It is, OK, then. I, I got out. I managed to get them. Right, then. It's, it's OK. Is everybody out of the building? No, there's still my partner in. The phone call... Um, on the face of it, sounded very genuine. She sounded distraught. She was hysterical. But actually, the first information imparted was a, more of an account about what they'd been doing, uh, like a rehearsal, rather than just saying, I need help, and I need help quickly. Over five days, the court hears how Julie's account changed throughout the investigation. From masked intruders to a joint suicide pact, to her assisting David in his own bid to take his own life. The defence argued, um, once Julie Dixon had pleaded guilty, 
that matters had spiralled out of control and that in some ways this had been a very an emotional response from Julie Dixon, um, almost that she had panicked because of the financial difficulty she had got into. Um, However, I think from the prosecution's point of view and certainly from the police point of view, this was a perpetrator who had changed her accounts whenever it had suited her, whenever she had been confronted with new evidence. There was always a line of defence. So it's hard not to see her really as a very skillful and manipulative liar. Julie Dixon didn't take the stand at all, didn't give evidence, was again very impassive, didn't present any emotion at any stage of the court proceedings, merely sat in the dock and appeared to be listening to the proceedings. The extent of the couple's financial difficulties is revealed to the judge. David wouldn't have had a clue about that bankruptcy. He was quite happy going about his everyday business. I think if he had found out that he had been declared bankrupt, he would have been incredibly upset being such a proud man. So. Yeah, she obviously kept that from him. And I can't see that those finances would have been enough for anyone to lose their life over. At the end of that hearing, Judge Heath had to decide whose account he believed. And he came firmly down on David Twigg's side and said that he in no way believed that David Twigg had wanted to commit suicide and he described Julie Tickson's account as a pack of lies. The judge was quite damning in his comments and quite clear that he thought it was a cold-blooded murder and that, you know, she, she'd been kind of playing the part and it was potentially worthy of an Oscar nomination if it hadn't been so sad and so true. Julie Dixon is sentenced to life with a minimum of 23 years for the murder of David Twigg. Eleven years on, he is still remembered fondly. No sentence can ever bring back a loved one. It will never be enough, of course, and it will never bring David back. Um, but I just hope it brings some little comfort to the loved ones and those who, who, um, who loved David so much. It just beggars belief that anyone would do that to another human being, um, a living person, someone you're supposed to care about, your partner. Um, it's just incredibly difficult to understand how anyone would do that. I think the harder thing is to wrap your head around is the way she calculated it, how she planned it all, what else was she planning, what else was she thinking. They say it's down to money, we'll never know. Obviously she don't care about anybody because obviously she did what she did, so no one will ever know what's going through her head. This investigation and this case impacted hugely on the community and the village of Burla Marsh. You know, people aren't going to forget what happened. Um, it's, it lives with them forever and whenever the name of the village is sometimes mentioned, people will talk about this case. I know I certainly will never forget it. She didn't answer us, and neither on Monday. The only communication that they had seemingly from her was by text message. When details started to appear of what had actually happened, it causes a lot of concern, a lot of fear as well. You could surmise that she'd been strangled or that the cord had actually caused her death. A lot of the neighbours would have been shocked, but also extremely puzzled as to how this could have happened. We were suspicious about the lies. It's big lies, you know? I live every day with the fact that I was friends with a murderer. At 
the edge of London lies the village-like suburb of Kew. Kew is one of the most sought-after areas of London. It's in West London. Kew is an extremely wealthy area. It's within commuting distance of the city of London and its wonderful nature beside the river and the Royal Botanic Gardens. It's very leafy, it's a very well-to-do kind of area, but it's fairly low crime as well. So it's, it's a nice area for people to live in. There is definitely a village feel. We have a very small high street. Uh, you will find a lot of independent trades around Kew, uh, which I think that's what people like. There's a lot of artists and uh, TV celebrities, and of course, Sir David Attenborough lives there. It's a world-class site. Kew was the perfect place for aspiring French filmmaker Laureline Gossia Bateau to set up home in 2009. Lolan was my best friend, my close friend. She was like a sister to me. We always be united. We always be in touch. We just developed a friendship, more than a friendship. Our children called her Auntie Lolo, and my daughter has her name. She was family. She was a vivacious, very popular, well-liked young woman who is beautiful on the inside as well as on the outside. She was easy to like and was a very caring and considerate kind of person. The future seemed bright for Loreline, and London was the place to help make her career ambitions come true. She was born in Aon Provence, but she came to London to pursue her dream of becoming a film producer. Lowline had a lot of patience, but she developed a, a real passion for cinema. She was a passionate people. She was a determined people. She was a hard worker. She started her own production company. She got a Grammy as a production assistant on a movie with Dam Joan Collins. For us, it was nice and amazing, but I know for England was a dream, and it was a dream. Despite a successful career, Loreline was happiest at home with her dogs. Loreline was a dog lover. She loves animals. She had an Instagram of a video every day with her two dogs, Haley, a Yuski, and Blake, a Rottweiler. Okay, so nice. They sleep on the they sleep on the bed, and we see that on Instagram every day. It's like they're sh her children for her. And on top of her busy life in the UK, Loreline stayed in regular contact with her family in France. Loreline was very close to her family. Oh yes, <laughs> she used to to call her mom every day and maybe twice a day <laughs> on the morning and the evening so the family for Loreline is everything family and friends and pets was everything in March 2019 Loreline was due to move out of her flat in Kew into a new place something friends and family were eagerly waiting to hear about on Sunday she didn't answer us neither on Monday and it was already strange. Certainly raised alarm bells the fact that Laureline had not spoken to her best friends and her mum and her family um, when she would normally speak to her mum every day and speak to her best friends very regularly as well. So the only communication that they had seemingly from her was by text message. But there was something unusual about Loreline's texts. Her friends had received some strange text messages from her, but didn't really chime with the kind of person that they knew her to be. For example, her best friend said that she 
thought it was strange that she said that she was going on a shopping spree in Oxford Street because she knew that she usually shopped online and got all her clothes from, from online retailers. She described how she was looking forward to getting a boob job and liposuction, certainly not the kind of thing that she would have said. So this kind of thing immediately raised alarms and, and they were very, very concerned that she just seemed, seemed to be communicating by text message, but nobody had seen her. Confused by Loreline's strange behaviour, her sister-in-law makes her way to the property in Kew. And when she couldn't find her, she alerted the police. Loreline was reported missing on the 6th of March 2019. And that means that a police officer would be dispatched to talk to her about her concerns and take a report. The missing persons inquiry started with questions to her sister-in-law and potentially any friends that could be found to say, have you seen her? Can you tell us when you last saw her? And the concern was raised because her sister-in-law had visited the address and she could hear dogs barking, Laureline's dogs, and no sign of Laureline. Laureline was a lover of dogs, so she, she would never leave her dogs alone. They were her children, essentially, at the time. And also, because it was now Tuesday, Laureline had failed to turn up for work, so work colleagues were now concerned. So you had a lot of people voicing their concern about where Laureline was, and that made it a, a concern for the police because this was completely out of character and completely unusual behaviour. Police begin their inquiries by also visiting Laureline's address. In a missing persons inquiry, police will attend an address, the place where a person lives, because within that premises, you might find something to indicate where they've gone. It might be a ticket, uh, might be a receipt, it could be anything. And also you want to make sure that they haven't come to harm behind locked doors. So there would be a natural instinct for officers to get into that premises, and quite often that's by breaking in, to check on the welfare of somebody. And that's what they did in this case. The officers went in, searched the premises, and she was not anywhere. But what officers could see inside that address was the boxes all still ready to be packed. It looked as if she was just about to move out. Her belongings were all boxed up, ready, as if she was about to move out of the flat straight away. So it looked like the home had been disrupted in some way. Back at the police station, officers assess the risk of Loreline's disappearance. A missing person is graded low, medium or high risk and different things happen at different levels. In the low risk, you've got people who perhaps uh, there's no particular harm that you can think, they might just have gone away and, and the concern is, is quite a low uh, for them. Medium risks are slightly more work is done around that because people are concerned but it might be within their character to go away for a weekend or something like that so it's not necessarily out of character whereas you have the high risk category and what, that's where Laureline sat because this was completely out of character. After reviewing the case as high risk police returned to Laureline's address for a more detailed search. They went out into the garden using torches. And in the garden, they had a look around and they could see various items leaning up against a fence, so a spade, shovel, other items that you would use in general gardening, and a bag of compost as well on the right-hand fence. And one of the officers then turned attention to the flower bed on the left-hand side as you walked into the garden and noticed that it was completely uh, brand new in one section. The CID officer moved the soil back closest to them and identified what they thought was the shape of a foot um, sticking out in a essentially a shallow grave. 
and just a few more scrapes to see what was there made them believe that what they had found was indeed a body. Searching for missing French filmmaker Laureline Garcia Bateau have discovered a body buried in her back garden. As soon as you find a body in a shallow grave in a premises, it becomes a murder inquiry straight away because that person doesn't put themselves there. And that's when the, the process of the team start to make their own inquiries and all the different actions that come out of that um, initial deployment begin in earnest. With a murder investigation in progress, police secure the scene. We had a lot of this area all cordoned off, a lot of crime scene tents here. Because as you bring items out of the garden as well, you, you need to put them somewhere which is forensically sterile. And so we tried to utilize the area out the back of the premises for that reason. So here really behind the house, the alleyway that we used and trying to set up a forensic um, retrieval here was, was quite difficult because the wind was so strong that it was hard. And obviously knowing how detailed you've got to be and how, um, you know, to avoid any contamination because it is windy and also you're dealing with an outside scene. It's particularly more complex than, than you would expect an inner scene to be. arrive on scene having been called by the homicide assessment team usually and we'll receive a briefing from the local borough police about what the incident involves and why it may be suspicious. Uh, once we've had a briefing be wearing protective clothing, mask, overshoes, gloves, scene suits and entering the scene to look for uh, to see what has occurred. The crime scene manager is in charge of that scene forensically, whether they be physical exhibits that are taken out of a premises or whether they are swabs or um, fingerprints, they're in charge of running that scene. The recovery of the body is totally down to the archaeologist and he'll work in tandem with an anthropologist. Uh, their speciality is bone analysis, who died, how they died and where they died. Working together, they can rapidly maximise the recording, interpretation and recovery of the body. As the team removes several inches of soil, it becomes clear that the individual is in fact female. Obviously, your first thought is, well, Laureline Garcia Bartu is missing and we have a body in the garden and it's suspicious that she's missing, so... Obviously, my thought is straight away, well, this is probably going to be Laureline. But you don't go to a family with probabilities. You have to be sure. As forensic archaeologists continue digging, the level of brutality on the victim becomes clear. Once the body was removed from the ground, she was lying on her back, naked. Uh, she was wrapped in a, a mattress and... There was silver duct tape around the area of where the knees and the neck were. The, the mattress was then wrapped in a cord around the middle of it. And, but around her neck, she had a, a, an electric wire. She had a head bag on, and her arms were tied behind her back with duct tape. You could surmise that she'd been strangled or the, the cord had actually caused her death. You couldn't see the rest of the body to determine what else was there. She may have been stabbed for all we know, but that wouldn't be able to be uh, looked at until we got to the mortuary. As the body is taken to the mortuary to establish a cause of death and identify the victim, news of a murder spreads. For a young woman's body to be dug up in a gardening tube. It would have been, you know, almost unheard of in a neighbourhood like that. A lot of the neighbours would have been shocked, but also extremely puzzled as to how this could have happened. I haven't 
ever heard of a murder in Kew. It's quite shocking to hear a murder in Kew. It's not normally uh, the norms of, of, of anything. When details started to appear of what had happened, people become very concerned about you know, something that's happening in your neighbourhood. It causes um, a lot of concern, a lot of fear as well. At the mortuary, the post-mortem gets underway. Once the body arrives at the, for the post-mortem, he would look at both sides of the body for any bruising, any wounds, anything that uh, stands out to him. There was no obvious bruising around the neck, but when, once you get the body opened up and get under the skin, then the bruising can be seen. Be checking the hyoid bone, the bone under the neck, if it's fractured, uh, and then it results in the conclusion that uh, death had been compression of the neck, believed via strangulation. With a cause of death established, it isn't long before the individual is identified as none other than Loreline Garcia Bateau. I was in my car alone and I just remember that it was Loreline's mother I hadn't found. So um, I just say the word, um, is it her? Is she dead? And I hung up. I remember I screamed. Um, I never screamed like that. It's taken a, a part of me. She was like my little sister, you know? It's taken um, a part of me. The investigation into Loreline's murder ramps up and initial theories are considered. Could this be a burglary gone wrong? It's a very attractive area for a burglar because there's a lot of assets there. So if someone's forced their way into the address and killed somebody uh, and then that person has disappeared, we need to identify them as soon as we can. So we'll be looking to make a light source examination, any finger marks that are um, not seen to the naked eye fingerprint examination, uh, I'll be looking for any DNA that we can find, possibly cigarette ends, they, uh, things have been moved by the suspect, he I may have opened drawers, cupboards, so we'll be looking to examine those, DNA, may, he may have cut himself somewhere, so he may have drops of blood that, have, that he's left behind. But a closer examination begins to cast doubts on a suspected burglary. If it had been a burglary gone wrong, you wouldn't expect them to hang around and attempt to um, uh, hide the body in the way that it had been. Police take into consideration Loreline's plans to move home around the time of her murder. Could the movers have been involved? Could it have been a handyman that had, you know, come round and helped box up her belongings? After making their inquiries, police discover that no removal firm had attended the address. So focus switches to Loreline's personal life. Certainly from her communication with her friends, it was suggested that when she'd last spoken to her sister-in-law, she was looking forward to going on a date with a vet that she'd met. But it was very unclear whether that date had actually taken place or who he was, even. Um, there was very little information given. Who had she been talking to online, on dating apps? Maybe she met somebody else. That was certainly something that could be unraveled through looking into her mobile phone and computer. Police decide to try to look into Loreline's last movements to see if they hold any clues. You look at things like Loreline's finance, so where has she spent money? which indicates that she might have been to a certain place, like a restaurant, which we found out on Friday the 1st, she'd been to a restaurant, and then that venue itself has CCTV. The CCTV shows Loreline dining with a man with the pair holding hands, and inquiries with those closest to Loreline soon identifies him. Loreline was in a 
on-off relationship for quite a number of years with a man called Kirill Belarusov. And this relationship had been going on for eight plus years, but had kind of fizzled out a couple of years beforehand, but they still saw each other on and off. And so they were aware that Kirill was in the UK as an Estonian national in the UK to come and help her move that weekend. Police continue to scour CCTV around the area. Both are later seen on bus CCTV, heading in the direction towards Loreline's home in Kew. It seems Kirill may have been one of the last people to see Loreline alive. But when police try to locate him, they find they are too late. They had discovered that Kirill was actually no longer in the UK. He had flown to um, Tallinn in Estonia. Belarusov has left the country. Police investigating the murder of Loreline Garcia Bateau want to speak to her ex lover, Kirill Belarusov, as he may have been one of the last people to see her. But police discover that he has left the country. The CID officers got in contact with Kirill Belarusov via a telephone number they had for him, which was given to them by the family. And they made contact straight away. He behaved like he didn't know what, what had happened and the last time he saw her, she was alive. Kirill tells police he was helping Loreline move on the Saturday before she left Q to move to a new address. But when asked further about this last encounter with Loreline, he doesn't give clear answers. He was being obstructive, in our opinion. He kept avoiding the question. I wanted him back in the country because I wanted to speak to him face to face. But he kept making excuses why he wasn't coming back or saying, yes, I'm just going to sort it out and then nothing would happen. He could do everything he could to come back he was saying he'd be back on one day, that day would go past, we'd ring him and he'd say, I couldn't make it, I'm gonna do another day. And this just kept pushing back and pushing back. And you get to a point where you think, well, that's enough. I know he's, I know he's trying to avoid him coming back. I think the fact that Belarusov is not keen to help the police in their inquiries, considering that um, Laureline had been his partner for the best part of 10 years, is extremely suspicious. And the fact that he left the country around the time of her dis disappearance as well would have raised alarm bells. Kirill Belarusov soon became the number one suspect in the inquiry. But with Kirill refusing to come back, police need to apply for an extradition order. The police have a fairly complicated process to get someone back from another country. The British police can apply for a European arrest warrant uh, which is what they did. Um, so they applied to get Belarusov back from Estonia, where he was at the time. But for the Crown Prosecution Service to agree, the police need to prove they have enough of a case against Kirill. When you get a European arrest warrant, as this was, when you bring them back into the country, you have no power to interview them. So you have to do everything without asking them a question which is very, very difficult because you're not giving, firstly, someone the ability to explain, but also you have to reach that threshold of evidence, which means that as soon as they set foot back in this country, you can charge them straight away with the murder. With police needing to build a firm case against Kirill, they start to dig into his life. I met Kirill whilst working in a nightclub. It was called Egg, and we started working together, and that's how we met. Kirill was very charming. He was very nice. He was not, you know, arrogant or trying to tell his side of the story. He was always waiting for you to ask a question before bragging or saying anything. Kirill told me about Laureline when we met. He didn't say her name, but he mentioned that he had an ex-girlfriend that he was really in love with um, and that they broke up. But Sabrina recalls how Kirill later spoke in more detail about his and Laureline's relationship and claimed she had cheated on him. 
he mentioned that he'd had cancer before and that he couldn't have babies anymore and that one time his ex fell pregnant and she didn't know that he couldn't have babies and that's how he found out that she cheated and that's how the relationship ended. He would always say that it was his fault and that she was very caring and that it was hard on her, the fact that he had cancer. So he wasn't blaming her, but he was saying that's how they ended it. Sabrina remembers the last time she saw Kirill before he left the UK for his home country of Estonia. The last time I saw Kirill, he told me before that he was going to die, that his cancer was terminal, and that was the last time I was ever going to see him. He said, he sold his house, I'm about to die, let's go dinner. And I went to that restaurant crying, I cried most of the night saying, I'm going to lose my friends. With police still unable to question Kirill to see if his account of his illness is true, they turned to Loreline's finances to try to establish her whereabouts the weekend of her murder. Through continued interrogation of finances, we see that on Saturday, round about quarter to 10 in the morning, that there are transactions in Pets at Home and Sainsbury's, all local to where Laureline lived. So again, officers are there as quickly as possible to identify CCTV opportunities. And there you see Kirill Belarusov with Laureline again. So now we know he's with her in the morning. At a glance, all appears to be fine. But when police look at Laureline's finances a day later on the Sunday, there appears to be no sign of any purchases. Instead, they look into Kirill's finances. So we start to look at transactions that Kirill might have made as well. And what you could see on Sunday the 3rd of March was Kirill had left premises and had gone to a local retail park, similar to where Laureline and he had been the day before. He'd been to Sainsbury's, been to Homebase, and been to convenience stores through that morning and was purchasing items which were highly suspicious. They were the rubble sacks that matched the rubble sacks that were found on Laureline's body. He had purchased an axe, which we never found, and he had purchased soil or compost, as it was. And you could see the CCTV of him, identifying him clearly as the person purchasing those items. And so you could say straight away then that it's very, very clear what he was up to. That was now that Laureline had been killed and he was thinking of ways to dispose of her body. With Kirill's behaviour raising suspicions, police approached the CPS. We had to go to the Crown Prosecution Service and prove what we had using all of the information we had, CCTV, finance, witness statements, the crime scene itself, the condition of Laureline's body. And that was something which is very, very difficult. But we were able to prove at that point that we had enough evidence to secure a arrest of Kirill Belarusov. And that gives you the ability to get a European arrest warrant and bring them back. He was brought back on the 20th of March uh, and charged with the murder of Laureline. Kirill Belarusov will go to court the following day to a magistrate's court where, because it's murder, they send it to the Crown Court and then he's due to enter a plea some eight weeks later. And that plea is not guilty. So we knew at that point we are going to trial with him at some stage in 2019. And as the case is prepared for trial, potential witnesses are called in by the police and prosecution. The police called me saying, we want to talk to you about your friend Kirill. And I thought they were calling me to say that he was dead. They told me he's been arrested, he's killed someone. Um, I was in shock. I was like, are you sure that it is the right person? And they said, yes. You don't murder, you don't think that you knew a murderer? Kirill Belarusov has been charged with the murder of his ex-partner, 
Loreline Gossier Bateau. The trial begins at the Old Bailey in London, and the prosecution open their case against Kirill with DNA evidence from the crime scene. The flex that was used to tie Loreline's hands behind her back, you could see that flex on the floor in the living room where um, it had been cut. And indeed, the forensic testing showed that Kirill Belarusov's DNA was at the cut part of that flex. The jury hears of the early relationship between Loreline. You know, he came to spend a few days with Loreline at my home. He ate at my parents' table. He was a superman, a good boy. And Kirill had even boasted of his career achievements to Loreline. He had told people he was a stuntman and that he'd worked on films with famous people like Brad Pitt um, and that he was uh, training people. We searched in the, in the industries at Hollywood and we searched in the UK, IMDB, to see where was he in these films. And they're always shown if you work on there. He was nowhere to be found. These were all complete and utter lies that he told everybody. But the lies did not stop there. He began to say to lots of people that he was sick and that he had um, 10 years left to live. He didn't talk much about his cancer. You would ask him questions and he would say, I'm bleeding from every hole. I've been puking for the last three days. I think it's just once where I said, if you don't mind me asking, what, what is the cancer? Where is it? And he said, oh, it's the pancreas, it's the liver area. And then the time after, he would be like, oh, it's spread everywhere. But he would never give any more details. He'd just say, I'm a guinea pig. They've opened me up and stitched me. They keep on opening me up. And, but he wasn't very specific. Loneline's mother, friend, and I found it very strange because he has nothing in front of us. When we saw Cheryl, uh, my wedding day, or for a holiday, we can't imagine he's sick. I've never known someone who had cancer. So when I saw him with a shaved head, I didn't question it. I didn't think he still had eyebrows. And I didn't know that you'd lose your eyebrows when you have chemo. We were suspicious about the lies. It's big lies, you know. We were suspicious. We tell that to Loreline. We, we explained to her to, to open her eyes, but she was in love. And we were discovering that almost all of his entire life that he told people about was a complete lie. Saying you've got cancer when you don't have, for me, is the lowest of the low. The prosecution also reveals to the court more about Kirill's double life. Every time he suggested he was going in for treatment to a hospital in London or just outside of London, what he was actually doing was going to stay with another girlfriend in London. That girlfriend also was told the same lie by him that he had cancer. So when he was not with her and saying that he was away for a few days, he was going to stay with Laureline. It's only when I sat down in court that I realized that he was texting the three of us at the same time, his girlfriend, Laureline and me. So it was really like juggling between the three of us. With me, he was supposed to be in Russia having treatment, and then he was actually in London seeing Laureline, talking to Laureline. I felt like a fool. I felt so stupid. It was so shocking. The prosecution described that as Laureline's film career began to take off, Kirill may have looked towards her with envy. He wanted a career in films as well, to a certain extent. He wanted to be a stuntman. Um, but... He wasn't, and he couldn't have been because he didn't have the skills to do that. He, his only skill was lying, whereas she was genuinely talented. And she was very, very hardworking, and she was prepared to earn her place in her chosen career. So I think there was, probably was an element of jealousy in the relationship. 
but it's details of a debt owed to Loreline which could point towards a motive for murder. She had given him so much money over the course of their relationship. And we knew you were talking plus £17,000 at least at that point. And that was getting to the point where he had to pay that money back. In November 2018, Laureline had sent a message to Kirill. And this was saying, you don't realise how much in debt, how much in trouble I am. I can't pay my rent. You need to pay me the money back. And from friends and family, we would always hear stories where he would promise this money. It's coming, I've got this job, this stuntman job, whatever it might be, which was all lies. So he knew he could never pay that back. That could be one motive. Secondly, she was at that point in her life now where she was ready to move on, away from him. And she was effectively a source of income for him as well. And that was about to dry up. To the court's surprise, Kirill gives evidence. I think the most shocking about the trial was himself. He took the stand and spoke, and it was just, I think it lasted two days, and it was two days of horror. Every word that was coming out of his mouth was horrible. The way he talked about me, the way he talked about Laureline, the way he saw himself, the arrogance in his voice, I remember sitting down terrified because I had been so close to him and just thinking, that man is a monster. It was traumatising. I always think about the people over the years that have um, been in front of you in a trial and he's probably right up there as the most evil looking eyes I think I've ever seen. And because behind it you can see that he really doesn't care. You know, his image and what he's portrayed himself as is more important than anything else. And he was really, really unpleasant and arrogant beyond belief during the entire four-week trial at the Old Bailey. The court hears how in March 2019, Loreline begged Kirill one last time to pay back what was owed to her. But instead, he used this opportunity to kill Loreline. You have the timeline of them going out on the Friday night, which we can see. We have the timeline of them going shopping on Saturday morning. She had booked a removal company ready for Saturday, but she didn't know where she was moving to because Kirill Belarusov had said he has found somewhere for her to move to. She had no money because he owed her a lot of money. She kept asking him, where am I going? And you could see that through telephone contact. Well, where is this address? I need to tell my removal company where we're going. And so the, the removal company basically said, well, I can't move you to nowhere. So it was all cancelled. Kirill Belarusov comes up with a new lie. This is, he's organised a removal company for her. But the removal company never came. And you get to the point then where Laureline is panicking because... She doesn't know where she's going, and she's clearly getting to that point in the evening where, on that Saturday, she's starting to disbelieve what he's saying. And that's when everything goes quiet. It's at this point that Kirill strangled Loreline with a cord. And the following morning, he was seen in local shops purchasing suspicious items. Kirill had been out and bought these items on the Sunday morning, which were used to cover the body of uh, Laureline. After returning to Laureline's home to bury her body, Kirill used her phone to send fake texts to Laureline's friends and family to buy some time. He foolishly used Google Translate to try and reply to the family members in French and obviously it's not going to sound very credible it's not it's not going to sound like Laureline not the words that she would use and and the translation was extremely clunky so it was immediately quite suspicious and at the time that those messages were being sent he was using the wi-fi of the address itself so that puts him inside the address using her phone Sickly looking at pornography at the same time he's sending these messages, knowing full well 
that in that house is Laureline's body. And that really shows you what kind of person he is. It's very difficult to comprehend a person who has that kind of personality, that, that very strange and almost psychotic personality. By the time concerned family and friends of Loreline get in touch with Kirill about her disappearance, he's leaving the country for Estonia. Take it. 